Today in High Five Church History, we're going to talk about Constantine, a very influential, significant figure in the church-state relationship, an issue, conversation, and topic that continues to come up even in our societies today. So again, we're going to talk about Constantine and more today in High Five Church History. Constantine was a Roman emperor during the 300s AD who was very, very influential in the church-state relationship. So today we're going to talk about three different aspects of Constantine and his life. First is going to be Constantine and his conversion. Second is going to be Constantine and the Council of Nicaea. And then third will be Constantine and church-state relations. So let's go ahead and get started in Constantine and his conversion. In 312 AD, Constantine defeated Maxentius at the Battle of the Milvian Bridge. Now, Maxentius was also another Roman, powerful Roman who claimed to be emperor. Constantine, though, claimed to be emperor as well. This led then to their fight. Constantine told the church historian Eusebius that as he was seeking help from the supreme god to overcome the powerful magic used by Maxentius, he saw a cross during the battle that was above the sun. And by the cross were these words, conquer by this. Now, in addition, Constantine claims that Christ appeared to him in a dream and told him to use Cairo, the first Greek, first two Greek letters and the word Christ, so that he and his men would be safe from his enemies during the battle. Constantine puts the sign on all of his soldiers' shields, heads to Rome, and defeats Maxentius. After this occasion, Constantine begins to favor Christianity by giving immunities to the clergy and providing gifts to the church. However, he continued to use pagan titles for himself and had pagan gods minted on royal coins. Some speculate that Constantine never truly converted to Christianity, but used Christianity as a means to unify and strengthen his Roman Empire. This then will lead us into Constantine and the Council of Nicaea. Constantine sought for Christianity to help unite his empire. Christianity, however, was currently undergoing some disunity itself. Arius, a presbyter, or you could say minister of a local church, in Alexandria said that God, the Father's dignity and honor, would be compromised if the church believed that Jesus Christ had the same eternal divine essence as God. So Arius developed a system asserting that God had made Jesus before time began and that God made all other things through Jesus. Consequently, Arius proposed that Jesus was greater than humans but less than God. This view known as Arianism spread rapidly throughout Alexandria and, the, and Eastern Christianity, but also developed great controversy in Christian circles. So Constantine ordered all Christian bishops, or those who oversee a specific region of churches and their ministers or presbyters, he ordered all of the bishops to gather as representatives of the universal church to resolve the issue. This council of bishops met in Nicaea in AD 325 and developed the Nicene Creed, which affirmed that Jesus is of the same essence of the Father and is eternal God rather than a created being. Constantine approved of the council's conclusion, and he consequently banished Arius and his followers. Now we're going to see really the development of Constantine and church-state relationship. The relationship between the church and the state took on new developments because of the Emperor Constantine, and I wanted to discuss four of these developments with you. First, we see the development of the Caesaropapacy, or state domination of the church. Over time, Constantine and his sons who followed him saw themselves as the bishop of the bishops leading the church and the state to almost have identical leadership structures. Second, we see the development of political influence within the church. Christians began to organize themselves just as the empire did, by cities, regions, and national sections. In other words, in our American government, we have cities, counties, states, and the nation as a whole for levels and different things of hierarchy. The church, though, begins to take on a similar structure. Furthermore, the state sought the unity of its citizens through the church. So the state pushed for people high up in the church to also be loyal to the state. Third, many people began to join Christianity even though they never experienced true conversion. Rather, they joined the church because Constantine offered incentives, and the church demanded little if any proof of authentic conversion. Consequently, pagan ideas began to enter the church, and this leads to our fourth development we see the influx of corrupt pagan influence within the church, leading some to monasticism. 
as monasticism allowed them to separate from the pagan influence and to dedicate much of their lives to prayer, fasting, and other Christian spiritual disciplines. Today in High Five Church History, we took a very brief glimpse at the life of Constantine and his significant influence in the church-state relationship. The way that we can apply this now to our lives is by asking, how are we using our Christianity in the political sphere? Someone like Constantine seems to be using Christianity ultimately for pragmatic reasons, for his own means. But we as the church, are we living like that as well? Or are we ultimately living our lives as Christians for the glory of God? We must keep this in the forefront as we continue to interact with our community and our government system. Yes, we want to support Christian ethics, but are we only doing so ultimately for our own selves or for God? This is a question that we have to continue to ask and be part of the conversation even in today. Thank you again for watching this episode. I'll ask that you'll like it. Please subscribe to Keep Thinking if you haven't already. And I can't wait to see you next week as we continue to high five church history. <laughs>